this book was the outgrowth of uh, uh, a small piece of an earlier book that was called How Everyday Products Make People Sick, which was the story or even the biography of several different routine products like glue and bleach. And one chapter in that book was about, mostly about the early history of rubber and vulcanization where the chemical that's the main player in this book was first used commercially. And that, that chemical's at the center of this book. It's something called carbon disulfide, which most, uh, uh, even most uh, physicians would never have heard of and it might have used it in an organic chemistry lab or, or something like that. Uh, but it's not known to the public particularly, although it did feature in a subplot of uh, one of the soap operas, uh, one of the very popular soap operas where they were going to uh, poison the world with carbon disulfide. And I forget which, which one it, it wasn't General Hospital, but it was something like that, you know, the young and the brave or something. Uh, and uh, the title of the book, Fake Silk, is, uh, it has to do with uh, rayon, uh, or artificial silk as it was known. And what a lot of people don't realize is that rayon and viscose are the same thing. And so when you, I don't know who's, who can reach their labels easily, but if you look at what you're wearing, it could easily be a viscose blend. And that, that means that it's part, part rayon. And it was the first synthetic textile. It's made from cellulose, and it was introduced uh, at the beginning of the 20th century commercially. So as I dug deeper and deeper into the story, it just kept going on and on in all kinds of different uh, uh, ramifications, or, or rays, I could say, rayons. In terms of your own scientific and medical background, uh, what prepared you to tackle this subject, and and uh, and what led you to uh, to be interested in it? Well, I'm a, a practitioner of a, a a not so wildly popular field, which is occupational and environmental medicine. So Why isn't it popular? Well, it's, as as one, as one. Uh, <laughs> One friend of mine who was getting married, I ended up sitting next to his wife's aunt, and she said, uh, tell me, what does the groom do? And I said, well, he's an epidemiologist. And she said, well, what is that? I said, well, that's the study of patterns of diseases in populations. And so she thought a minute, and she said, tell me, is it lucrative? <laughs> so. So similar with I, so it's not popular partly because it's not sexy, it's not lucrative. But part part of that is uh, is what interests me a lot in occupational disease in particular is uh, chemical exposures and toxicology. And if you're interested in toxicology, this chemical carbon disulfide is really quite fascinating because it's so specially and terrifically and horrifically toxic. And, and that really was the first thing that drew me into the story. So the, for example, and it wasn't subtle, the, uh, the main first effect of carbon disulfide that was recognized, and this was in the rubber industry before there was anything like rayon, it was used as a vulcanizing agent. And in France, in little workshops where they used this stuff, uh, the workers went insane. So high level exposure causes manic psychosis. And that, that was a well recognized phenomenon, not just in the 19th century in the rubber industry, but, but in the rayon industry as well. And uh, right down through the 1950s, there were cases in the developed world. And of course, we don't know what's happening where rayon's being made now. One of the things that I think is particularly uh, terrific in the book is, is, is and it, it's a very uh, lively book to read, and one reason that, it, that that's true is, 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 is that the, there's lots of uh, cultural references. Uh, uh, Paul's already referred to a, to, a, to a soap opera, and there are references to books and musicals and, and so forth. Um, uh, uh, so there's a lot of cultural history in the book. As the world turns, uh, yeah. I think, by the way. Uh, 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 including high and low culture. 
Um, That's uh, uh, what. How did you how did you come to that? What prepared you to, or, or, or why were you interested in that aspect? It's always uh, uh, been a way that I I can see of tying stories together. And in fact, I, I went down the pathway of occupational health uh, from my my college days, and I was in a experimental college, uh, also can be referred to as a hippie school uh, in Vermont called Goddard, which was the place you went to if you thought Antioch was too structured. Uh, and and um, my senior study, uh, I wanted to combine politics and theater, and so I wrote, and science, so I wrote a, a agitprop theater piece about vinyl chloride, which caused cancer in, in plastic production workers. And when I did that project, I found it was really helpful to weave together cultural history with scientific history and political history. And so that sort of started me down that but, path. But so you were, even, you were interested in this topic when, when you were an undergrad, this sort of topic. Yeah. Uh, 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 well, actually, that leads me to, 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 to uh, my next question. Um, why do you think, in personal terms, uh, uh, that 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 you were interested in this topic? Uh, as you know, I know, and of course, my uh, uh, one of my own interests is 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 the Spanish Civil War, and um, I was fascinated to discover that 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 uh, Paul's mother uh, ha had been a nurse, um, in uh, American nurse. In the in in the Spanish Civil War, uh, which which of course suggests a certain um, uh, uh, political awareness <laughs> in the family. Uh, uh, um, so I mean, so what was and so you had this interest quite early on. I mean, where, where do you think it came, did it come from? Personal, or what do you think is is what shaped uh, in terms of your uh, upbringing and early experience, uh, it, 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 what led you to be interested in this sort of topic? Well, you know, yeah, it's, it's, it's how you grew up. It was the times because, you know, I grew up in San Francisco, so I was in high school just down the street from here in the middle of the summer of love, so you could walk out at lunch break and go to the hate. Uh, and, uh, as, and as you point out, my, my mother and my father were both the uh, uh, politically progressive. My mother, as you know, had been in Spain and she'd, she was a nurse. She'd been kicked out of the California Nurses Association for union organizing in the 50s. It's, sort of, it's a nice touch that we're in the School of Nursing yeah, building. This is where she went to school, not in this building, but she was a graduate of the School of Nursing here and knew uh, Leo Aloesser uh, as one of her teachers and he went to Spain as well and other people from San Francisco. And my father uh, was a geneticist by training and uh, lost his career in the McCarthy era, was uh, a university professor, was kicked out. So yeah, I grew up uh, early on with, with a, a strong political sense and it is true that occupational medicine is a, uh, is a discipline that draws people that are concerned uh, about uh, workers and workers' health. It also draws people who, who aren't, but uh, so one of the big arguments in the field is uh, trying to remind young doctors in training that their patient is, is the worker, that the corporation is not their patient. That's not who they're taking care of. But sometimes that takes. Who, who's paying the doctor? Uh, not, I, these days, very few actually companies have doctors. So it's usually some kind, it's either a very large organization uh, or it's some kind of group practice that has a bunch of clients. Do you think, were there other personal, personal motivations, uh, either political or just idios or more idiosyncratic? Well, obviously, it's, anything I do is pretty idiosyncratic, <laughs> but uh, I, I, well, I, I, I say that as a neutral term. Right. right. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think that occupational health, and I see this in, in, in my peers, it, it's, a, it's a really good um, illustration of uh, who bears the burden and 
and the other guy gets the benefit. And, and so as a, if you're concerned about social justice and if you work in healthcare, it's a very good place to, to put your effort and feel like you're making the world a little bit better rather than a little bit worse. And so this is an extension of that in a way. Whom do you see as, as, as the readers for the book? Well, I, I wrote this as if I was, you know, my, one of my role models is Burton Ruscha, you know, used to write these, these toxicologic uh, essays in, in The New Yorker, or, or Paul Brodeur, who later, the next generation wrote about uh, asbestos in The New Yorker. So my, my target audience is an interested lay reader. And I want, wanted and want very much to make the material interesting and accessible uh, to, to a general reader who's knowledgeable and interested, but not knowledgeable about this subject. At the same time, I want it to pass muster with uh, professionals. And so it's, 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 it's ex excessively footnoted, but not in the middle of the text at the end. So if you want to use this book, to do research and to document, you want to say something and find the original source, it's, it's here. You focus on how it, that specific chem, chemical, carbon disulfide, if I pronounce it correctly, uh, was dangerous to workers uh, and it has such awful consequences as you docu document so extensively in the book. Uh, did you think of the, the chemical as somehow as a, as a character, uh, 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 almost as, uh, were, were you writing the biography of this malign character? Uh, in some ways, yes. I mean, it, 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 it was a character, and it was also a character in the way that people talk about writing a novel where the character uh, seems to have a will of its own and it starts going off in directions that uh, you couldn't have foreseen. So I think that there was an element of that, partly because the story, you know, went in so many different directions. Uh, there was, uh, would, in, in fact, even after I, I finished the book, I would come across things that aren't in, in it because it, I only learned about it afterwards. Well, one example is that this is not carbon disulfide as much as the final product ran. I always thought that the fabric safety flammable safety laws in the United States, as effective or ineffective as they are, were an outgrowth of cotton pajamas and children burning with, from cotton. And it turns out that the original uh, laws that were passed in the 50s, in the early 50s, were because of a number of deaths from sweaters made of a very special kind of brushed rayon, fluffy rayon, that one, it would catch fire, would go up instantly in flames, and people were killed. And they were called torch sweaters because of this. And I didn't, I mean, I wrote this, I spent 10 years writing this book, never came across that, and just sort of stumbled a, across it a few months ago. Um, so that, that's an example. Um, and just uh, the ways in which things just turned out to be uh, connected and interconnected in, in various ways but always at the center of this carbon disulfide, which is without which you can't make the rayon, and then the rayon itself. So why is it essential? What, what does it do? It's a very, very peculiar solvent. It dissolves nearly anything, and it has a dissolving capacity for cellulose, such that the process lets you rearrange the fibers uh, break them apart and then rearrange them and then reproduce um, cellulose. So it's it's like producing, it's like the the cotton plant producing cotton or the spider producing its thread. It, it just manages to do that. Uh, the process is that you take wood pulp or some other source of cellulose, you grind it up, you soak it in caustic, mm -hmm. then you throw in a bunch of carbon disulfide, let it sit, and put and it becomes this kind of yellow toxic maple syrup that you push through pipes into a bath of sulfuric acid and you spray it out under the sulfuric acid through these little tiny nozzles you have to make the nozzles out of gold or platinum or 
tantalum because otherwise it disintegrates in the acid bath. And then the fiber, the cellulose, is regenerated. And there's no carbon disulfide in the final product. But that's the problem because the carbon disulfide just bubbles off into the workroom atmosphere, basically, unless there are special protections. How, how is this all discovered? Uh, in, uh, well, in the late 19th century, there were a bunch of different people trying to invent um, a synthetic cellulose. Uh, and fiber. Why was there, a, a, why was this need felt? I mean, were, were not the cotton or wool, were, were, was well, it running out? Well, there's a lot out? more wood than there is cotton. It's a lot cheaper to cut down trees than to raise cotton, so, and wool similarly. So that, that was part of the drive, and this made a, uh, also, this made a fabric that was had a lot of silk-like quality. So it was artificial silk or art silk or Kunstzeit in German, uh, and that was and it was far cheaper than silk. That's that was certainly true. There were a bunch of competing processes. In fact, uh, this one kind of won out, but there was another one called uh, nitrocellulose, which. Uh, um, unfortunately, the factories had a tendency to blow up because nitrocellulose is very close to gun cotton, and so it's an explosive. And then there's another kind uh, that doesn't use carbon disulfide. It's called cuprimonium silk, or in the old days it was called Bemberg silk. So there was a, a novel in Weimar, Germany, called The Artificial Silk Girl, and it, it has quite a bit of, uh, of viscose rayon in it, but it also has even more Bemberg silk because she thought there was nothing, bet this, the tawdry protagonist thought that underwear made of Bemberg silk was particularly wonderful. And this was all happening in the individual countries, but they're also presumably, they're, they're, of course, there's a, a, a rich sense of, of uh, well, was there international cooperation or well, international not, rivalry or no, both? No, no, this wasn't, uh, this was the prototype of the multinational corporation. All of these corporations were interconnected. Cortols in Britain, uh, Glanstoff in Germany, Snea Viscosa in Italy, they all owned pieces of each other. And in the United States, uh, there were two producers. Uh, uh, the biggest one was called the American Viscose Company, which was, an, or corporation, which was entirely a subsidiary of um, Cortols in England, and then DuPont, uh, where the, they were, competed with each other. And uh, in fact, um, it was such a big business. It was Cortol's cash cow, the American business. Wholly owned, not publicly owned. So in the run-up for Lend-Lease, the United States said, if you want us to bring Lend-Lease to Congress, you have to make Cortol's a public company or American Viscos Corporation. Because of the money. So in fact, uh, the UK was pretty upset about this, even despite everything else. And they sent uh, Keynes over to argue against this, to try to convince the Americans not to force Cortol's, even though Cortol's wasn't a, wasn't a British, lead, wasn't publicly owned, right, but a private corporation, but they sent over <coughs> Keynes. Unfortunately, on the other side of the table was a guy named uh, Harry Dexter White who went on to form the International Monetary Fund. He was the Undersecretary of the Treasury. And he, as it turned out, had done his doctoral thesis on tariff controls, on tariff protections in the rayon industry. So he knew all about rayon. So that was Keynes' adversary. And of course, uh, another interest, uh, I don't know, uh, my mind tends to go by free association, so I hope you'll forgive me. Uh, another interest that Paul and I share is an interest in Bloomsbury. And, and of course, Keynes is the great economist of Bloomsbury. But, uh, 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 and I, I don't know whether it was a, a fact, but isn't it, if I have this right, it's later at Bretton Woods yes. that, that he and uh, uh, they were supposed to, I mean, it became very controversial. And, <laughs> and were he and, and De, 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 Dexter White? Uh, yeah, were, Harry were, were very, uh, very much worked together. Yeah. So yeah. was their, their alliance, uh, they began it adver as adversaries, no, I mean, and this, you know, that was probably you know sparring partners. Let's say, yeah, yeah. But that's where they, they that's where they initially uh, initially were together. Yeah, I'm sure they knew each other professionally before that, but yeah, yeah. 
Well, there are a lot of uh, there. Are, uh, and then another one of these, on the same theme about the interlocking directorates. There was a book uh, called *Labor and Silk* that was published in 1925 or so, which was part of the *Labor and* series, which was kind of the all about books of the U.S. Communist Party. They were books. There was labor and lumber, and labor and coal, and labor and silk was mostly about the real silk industry. But there's a whole chapter in there about artificial silk, and that includes a drawing, uh, uh, a figure of the interlocking directorates of various size circles, of depending, and each country. So there's Germany, Italy, and U.S. and all that, and who's connected to who, and um, and I had used this figure and talked about it. And then at a certain point, while I was at Stanford, actually, it occurred to me, you know, who actually did the illustrations for this book? The, the woman who wrote the book was a really important uh, uh, American communist. But I didn't pay attention to who did the, the uh, drawing. So I went back to the book. And I, it was somebody I'd never heard of, somebody named uh, Esther Schimitz. So now that it's the age of the internet, it really changes research. So I could get on Google in about five seconds and look up Esther Schimitz. And it turns out that Esther Schimitz went on to marry with Taker Chambers. Oh, yes. yes. <laughs> and I remember sitting there, I go, this can't be possible. This is too bizarre. But so she, 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 left the, 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 she left the party, yeah. And she agreed with his politics. She stood by him. Yeah, but, 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 by her but, but, but as far as you know, silk or fake silk didn't pay, play a part. No, but not beyond that. Uh, one thing that's particularly terrific and wonderful about the book is, is, is this, uh, I mean, it's obviously it's, it's a general story in many ways, and a story about these, these firms and, and factories and international relations, but uh, uh, connections. Uh, but, th but there's also a, a uh, uh, quite a few uh, individual stories, particular stories. Uh, uh, which were the personal stories that you found the most compelling? And uh, how, did, how did you find, find these people? How did you find out about them? Uh, sometimes it was by a little comment that, that intrigued me. Um, there was a very important woman in the history of occupational medicine. She was based in the United States. And her name was Alice Hamilton. Uh, she lived to be 101. Um, she was the first woman on the faculty of Harvard at all. And she was in the School of Public Health. Um, and the, the, she got on, she, she was allowed to join the faculty on two conditions. One, that she would not sit on the dais during commencement with the male faculty, and that she would not take her tickets that would otherwise have been coming to her to the Harvard-Yale game as a faculty member. But um, I'm assuming she got some kind of pension, which therefore had her revenge by living to that age, I guess. Um, anyway, she's very well known. And, and she, she was very interested in carbon disulfide and the rayon industry, and in fact did a, a study uh, in 1940 uh, of, of the rayon industry on, on behalf of the U.S. Department of Labor. She was f close to Francis Perkins and uh, also close to Eleanor Roosevelt. But as I dug deeper, I found that there was a pilot study that was done before the big study, and it was done at her behest. But the doctor who did that study out of Bryn Mawr uh, College uh, was was named Adele Cohn. And I had never heard of an occupational physician named Adele Cohn. Was named. So I went on a long search to find out who this person was and what she did. And in fact, this was the only occupational health thing she did. She left um, not long after she did this study. She did some training in tuberculosis and then went off to China uh, and served as a nurse in Sichuan or you know, inland China during the war where she met a Brit who worked for the Red, Co Red Cross and married him and moved to England, which is why I couldn't find any trace of her. And then uh, kept digging, kept digging, and uh, 
managed to track down her son, who's about my age and lives in London. So on one of my visits to London, I got to sit down and have tea with him. And, and he gave me some other material with his mother, but he'd never heard of any of this occupational health stuff that she did. And they would actually, what her study was is she would go uh, to the one or two big factories that were in Pennsylvania. That's where the industry was based at that time. And they would sort of secretly get workers off site because the factory wasn't cooperating in, and interview them uh, and do examinations. But also she went to the local mental hospital uh, and went through records you know, of uh, workers who'd been admitted there with psychosis. Never connected to the factory, by the way. The mental hospital just thought they had gone crazy with sort of atypical schizophrenia at the age of 40 or something, you know, not the age that people have onset of psychosis, typically. But you also located some, some victims, right? Or, I did. Or I, so uh, uh, first of all, I went to some closed down factories and met with uh, workers, including uh, in, East, in the former East Germany, where one of the big factories was in Wittenberg, Elbe, and also in Sweden, where there was a state-run factory. It was actually jointly owned by the state and the, and the labor unions, where conditions weren't any better. So, uh, Was that surprising? You, you would have hoped that, yeah. you know, that it might have been a little bit better. Uh, and then um, probably one of the more dramatic and, and, and devastating parts of this history is that rayon, because it didn't depend on cotton, but rather cellulose, was a very important, uh, was very important economically and politically to the Axis. And so Germany in particular ran rayon factories all over Germany and well, over, why, why was it so important? Because they were cut off from cotton and they didn't have enough wool and, and they viewed this as part of their economic independence or autarky is the term for this. Uh, this is pre-war or during uh, the war and during the war? During the war in particular, it, it, in the run up to the war and then in the war. And um, so they, they ran <coughs> camps with, they ran factories with slave labor or concentration camp labor and one of the Satellite concentration camps was in, in Austria, which was then part of the Reich, uh, in a place called Lenzing. It's a factory that's still, still in operation. But they had a satellite concentration camp, and I did have the honor of meeting one of the survivors uh, of that, uh, that camp, a woman who lives in North London, and had written a book uh, for children about the Holocaust. That's how I came across it. And what was the work compensated, or what? Did, did she get compensated? She got invited to Lensing. You know, they 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 actually felt feel bad about this, and so they invited her on all expense paid trip to you know see the factory, and she went. She was. And, and one point. I mean, this is a few years ago. A subsidiary question, but but I wasn't quite sure. Courtauld had an interest in the German factory, right? In one of them, yes. In, in, uh, but but I, even, I even had the impression that it did it continue during the war? The factory continued during the war. No, no, but it was Courtauld still involved? Well, about, well it depends on who sure. you ask. In fact, every single industrial site of any size at all in Cologne was completely destroyed by bombing, except this plant. So do so, we have a sort of, do you, do you think Cortos was in touch and said, don't bomb our plant? Yes, but I can't, <laughs> I can't prove that. The only thing, I, what I can prove with Cortos is that after the war, long after the war, uh, another hero was the local plant physician of the, the, the Cortos complex in North Wales, who started to do an epidemiologic project on heart attack in the workers. It turned out that the workers were dying at too much of a rate and at too young from heart attacks to be a coincidence. And he, he got connected with one of the leading uh, epidemiologists in, in the post-war period and did this project. Uh, and then they were stymied by, by Cortos. Cortos just stonewalled them in terms of giving them a roster of the workplace, workforce, so that they could actually calculate the rates and without being able to calculate the rates, they couldn't show what they knew was there. And it took about 10 years, and finally, they got the, the rates, the, the, the numbers from Cortals, published the paper in, 
in the British Journal of Medicine, and then Cortles fired the doctor. So he was he's quite was quite a hero, I think. I mean, the workers are, are in, in a, well, there are some heroes, such as the, the women you mentioned and, and the doctor who's fired, um, but I, and, 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 and the, the victimized uh, workers, uh, but they're clearly also villains. And, and um, the, uh, of course, a, a, a problem uh, for biographers is, is uh, or the biographical topics is, uh, Sympathy isn't quite the word, but uh, or, or, and I don't know whether empathy is the word either. But but somehow, you, how do you cope? How did you cope with with writing about uh, villains? And and as uh, you know, one of the colorful characters in the book is this uh, the British Home Secretary in, in the uh, 30s, uh, known as Sir William Joyce and Hicks. Who had a nickname of Jix, and he's he's he, 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 he's very busy stonewalling. Uh, how do you cope with writing about such people? Well, they're fun, so to the extent that you can sort of m make fun of them, like Jix's son Lancelot <laughs> Joiner Hicks, uh, who then became a, a member of Parliament. So you know you can kind of poke fun in, in that way, and, uh, and uh, I, I think perhaps it's as much a danger to make people like that two-dimensional. It's, it's, you know, like a, a, as Forster warns in aspects of the novel, you know, that you have to tell a story, but you can't, you have to have characters that are not flat. So, um, so it, it, it can be a challenge, but it, if you, if they're bad enough to like them, maybe this brings us back to the soap operas, but you can kind of paint them in that, that way, and at least that's how I, I approached Jix. Uh, there were other people, there was another person like that actually, also, a guy named, improbably, Mothworth, who was a, a, a rayon technocrat who was German, and was employed by one of, not by Cortles, but by another international company that owned a factory in Tennessee. And this guy was called in to suppress a strike uh, in Tennessee, this guy Mothworth. And uh, so he, he, not only before that, in 1918, he was arrested, in Amer he was already in America, and he was arrested as, for selling chemical secrets to the Germans, or being, essentially being a spy. And he got out of jail and somehow eventually reappeared and, and came to this factory. And then I sort of lost his trail. And then this, this factory lensing, the one that uses the slave labor, uh, is detailed in these, there are a series of, of publications by both the British and the American army, and some of them are joint, uh, looking at every single, you know, industry, Industrial asset in 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 Britain, and basically for you know what 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 what's going to happen after the war and what can we do with this stuff and they go to this plant in Lensing, and who's managing the plant in Lensing? It's Mothworth again. He like reappears. So he was like you know the the evil zealot of the rayon industry. So you see, you just have to kind of go with the flow, I guess. I don't know, but it is it is it is a challenge, but it's a good challenge. Uh, 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 one thing that struck me in the book was was uh, there seemed to be uh, 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 certainly uh, well maybe in all the countries right? but certainly uh, apparently in Britain and the United States um, lots of, there, there were more laws and regulations that that conceivably in in theory uh, 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 well I guess there are two questions. What the laws and regulations that existed as as you know national laws were they in theory strong enough to to police the industry and if so why didn't they uh, was it collusion whether you know the government agencies uh, 
lax or well, or, I, I, or, 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 or I guess there are two questions. I mean, were the reg regulations strong enough, if enforced, to police the industry? And if so, why weren't they enforced? Or, so, or weren't they strong enough anyway? I, I think both things are true. If you start at the present, the current Occupational Safety and Health Administration legal exposure limit for carbon disulfide is 20 parts per million, the 20 molecules of carbon disulfide per million molecules of air. And that is the least protective standard in the world, except for India. Only India is as bad as the United States. And why? Because NIOSH, which can't pass a standard, it can only make recommendations, its recommendation is 20 times lower than that. And the reason is because OSHA hasn't passed a new standard for almost anything since its inception. And when they tried to pass a standard uh, for a number of chemicals together, one of which included carbon disulfide, the industry, which was still quite strong at that time in the United States, fought back strongly. Now, there are no rayon textile or fiber factories anywhere in the United States now, but there's a lot of viscose rayon that is manufactured for other purposes. So how many people here have a kitchen sponge, like an Ocello or a 3M? Or That's viscose. That's what that's made of. Those are all rayon sponges. And uh, I don't know, are there any uh, aficionados of skinless weenies in the audience? Because of what? Skinless weenies. Because uh, uh, the rayon uh, casing, for synthetic cellulose casing for sausages and hot dogs, which you don't eat. You, you, you use it as a kind of placeholder when you fill it up and then get rid of it later on. That's all um, um, rayon, a viscose essentially also. And then the, the really big other product historically was cellophane. So cellophane is just like the rayon thread, only it's forced out in a thin film instead of a thread. And I'm presuming there's not a there's not a this is the only way that these products can be made. Is there basically, a, I mean, there is one one alternate now that the same factory in Austria bought the rights to, which uses a different chemical, but there's virtually no toxicity data on that chemical. Although it's hard to believe that anything could be as bad as carbon disulfide. But that that <coughs> patented process is not widely used, and it's a more expensive product. So the bulk of of uh, of um, rayon is still made the old-fashioned way, mostly in China and India and Indonesia. Those are the big centers for the textile. Uh, the, uh, some of those plants are owned by Lensing and others in Europe. Um, the, the irony is that it's marketed as a green product because it's made from renewable cellulose, right? Especially bamboo now is you know sexy as a. Why aren't the regulations stronger? I mean, is it, is it, is it, are the government powers, those in power in, in collusion or don't care or, or, or are convinced that profit is essential or what? Uh, probably a combination of all of those things. I would, you know, it's, you can't, you, it's very hard to find the smoking gun. Um, and then there's no, there's no downside because they don't really, it doesn't cost them, the health effects are, often delayed and don't cost them anything and are subtle. Uh, somebody gets, this, this chemical also causes Parkinsonism. So your worker gets Parkinsonism at the age of 50 and retires early, he's never gonna get compensated in the right way. Is, is there any country that's, that, that's good, so to speak? About, about this? About regulations? Oh, I mean, in general? I mean, the European Union is getting better about pre-market requirements and so forth. I mean, in general. I would say. And the modern lensing factory, by the way, which I've visited, is, is quite tightly controlled. It turns out that if you make the product with tight controls, you save money because you capture all the carbon disulfide as it comes off and then you recycle it and use it again. So you, you actually save money. But they had this old guy, older guy, not so old, who took me around. I guess he's not, you know, he's too, not physically fit enough to be a line worker, so one of the things he does is take visitors around. So he, he took me around the lensing factory and he took me up this tower 
all of these factories have towers. I'm not exactly sure what the purpose is where you put stuff up. I don't. But anyway, we go up. This is the tallest building in the factory site, and we go up there six floors, and we're looking out this this window, and he says, you know. Our last suicide from here was in 1955. And then he pauses and he said, of course, during the war, there were a lot more. <laughs> in a way, I'm surprised. You were given a pretty good access to factories? Uh, it depends. I would, you know, through context. I went to a factory in uh, Czechoslovakia as well, in the Czech Republic, that had belonged to Glanstoff, the German conglomerate, and then had closed down after the Velvet Revolution and has been reopened with foreign investment. And I got there because I, kn I know the occupational health doctor in Prague who could get connections, and we went there. And I think that to me what, I mean, it was a small factory, and it was, they were very friendly, but, but what struck me there was as, as we're driving up the highway and turning off the road to this factory, which is in a town called Lovesice, it's the same highway exit for Theresienstadt. And so then after I was there, I said, you know, I bet there were uh, slave what? laborers that, that went to, to this factory, and there, there were, actually. Oh, uh, how important are these? Uh, I had this me memory when I was growing up, but, but I, I can't remember exactly what was on the program. There, there, there was the, the, the DuPont Hour, yeah. Uh, but all I remember of it uh, about it was its slogan: uh, "A better life uh, through chemistry." <laughs> and and and, and uh, presumably, the, well, I guess there are two questions. Uh, presumably, the, the, do these products uh, make our life better? And uh, are they worthy products? Or, or, I mean, should they be banned because, because of the price that's paid to, to, to make them? Well, I mean, consumers are very fond of rayon, right? And always have been. And so I mean, what would our life be without cellophane? And what would our life be without cellophane? Of course, the interesting cultural history is that rayon has, for many years, also had this sort of cheap, you know, it's fake silk, so it has this sort of tawdry, Side to it, I mentioned uh, the artificial silk girl, this 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 novel from Weimar, but but you know you see it in uh, you know in Legally Blonde where there's a whole riff about rayon. On the other hand, you know cellophane has always been kind of fun and avant-garde and very modern, and that you know uh, people probably know the Cole Porter lyric. You're the Tops, your Greta Garbo's salary, your cellophane, your the National Gallery. I'm not doing the right order, but I mean, do do you think the product should be banned? No, no. I think it could be made safely if you controlled uh, you know, how by, by controls in, of the in, factory, in closing the in closing the process. Yeah. Are you optimistic or pessimistic or neutral? I, mean, I don't think there, it's Is there a campaign? But what now most of the manufacturing is in the third world? It's in India and China, and I'm not so convinced, particularly in Indonesia. I, 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 I really doubt that there's very good controls in India. And in fact, so one of the, the, the hazards, I, I didn't mention this particular uh, form of toxicity, aside from causing insanity, when you're have high exposure but a little bit less than what would make you insane, it, it, it's, it's disinhibitory. It affects centers of the brain that have to do with inhibition. And so in mid-century, mid-19th century France, when this was used in, in, in basically in the French condom industry was where the big exposure was. And, and the, you know, uh, there was a lot of lasciviousness described in the workers, both men and women. Uh, and then this was followed by impotence. So impotence is a in male impotence is a major major toxic effect. And I, I there's very little medical data on India, but I did find a book by an anthropologist about a factory town, a rayon factory town in India, and he was uh, making the argument that the the antipathy of the local population to this factory had to do with a. Uh, uh, deep-seated Indian religious view of the world and all of that. And one of his arguments in support of this was that uh, 
that the impotence that was widespread, reportedly widespread among the workers was symbolic of, you know, some kind of Godhead thing. And I just thought, oh my God, this guy doesn't know anything about this, this, this chemical. This is not a metaphor. This is reality. I mean, should we, um, because the DuPonts, uh, particularly say in the, in the Winterthur Museum, uh, uh, and, and I'm sure elsewhere, and, and of course one of the great, uh, great small, uh, one of the finest uh, small uh, museums. museums in the world, is, 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 and also a graduate school in the history of art, is, is Courtauld's, uh, in, in uh, the Courtauld School, in London, and of course, the most famous, uh, 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 the the very distinguished, what's his name, T.J. Clark, uh, who's uh, 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 now in London, but he was a professor of art history at 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 uh, Cal, and he wrote a famous book about about the most famous painting in in Courtauld's, uh, the the Manet of of the bar, the woman at the bar. Uh, 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 arguing that 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 uh, she was an oppressed worker, <laughs> so, <laughs> so in a way it sort of so, uh, circles, uh, back. circles back. I mean, should we have given up? It, w it would have been better uh, uh, not to have all these things. I, I mean, would, would or to put it in a rather sort of flat-footed way, um, would the would the world be a better place if we didn't have any of these products? And the high pr price that the workers have paid through madness, uh, uh, both 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 uh, excessive libidos and impotence, which seems very unfair to have both, and and, and, and uh, you know horrible uh, uh, illnesses. Uh, well, there's a there's a different uh, ethical question, which is. <laughs> um, what is the consumer's responsibility if I buy a product which is completely harmless to me, but somebody died making it. What is my ethical obligation? And in that way, there's nothing different about rayon than the cheap cotton t-shirt that you buy at the warehouse store for uh, much less than it really cost because some uh, schlub in Bangladesh on the 17th floor death trap walk up was selling this thing, right? There's no danger to you wearing the t-shirt, but there was a price that was paid. And so I think that's, that's the, the moral and ethical question. And I think you could, you know, I, I'm not a big believer in individual action doing things. I think it has to be collective and it's better to have state, state interventions, but um, Certainly, I mean, if consumers really uh, joined together and, 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 and demanded pr uh, protections on the way things were made. Oh, are there action groups? There, there actually are some around the Bangladesh uh, issue, I would say, and, and some of the major uh, clothing, uh, apparel, marketing, purchasing companies have given some traction to that. Have, have the students taken it up? No. I mean, there's, there's always this issue, you know, the question where students agitate um, uh, uh, at their universities about what the board of trustees should do about their stock options and so forth and so on. Yeah. This, this is not a Why isn't it a glamorous? You'd think with rayon and silk and so forth, it's somehow not a glamorous issue. Why not? Uh, I, I think, uh, well, I mean, it's not as. It's not as immediate to people as, as you know other things, and I can certainly say that in in this current political climate, it would be hard to argue that someone should invest their political capital specifically in this narrow question. If you know, when you think about everything that's happening in the world, I mean, I kind of understand that. It's, you know, I'm closer to this topic, but I I actually think that the utility in, in delving so deeply into this kind of topic is that it's, a, it's not only a, about itself, it's, it's a cautionary tale that's applicable to a lot of other things if you, you take the same principles. So uh, are you a combination of, of uh, <coughs> idealist and cynic? <laughs> are you hopeful but, but think that there'd be too much collusion between 
Well, that's funny. Ca capitalists that, and that government. You started off by asking me about my upbringing. Yeah. And so what basically you just asked me, what are you, your mother or your father? <laughs> so I guess I'm a little of both. Well, maybe that's a, I was going to ask you as the last question, what, what, uh, what, what, what should the ethical consumer do? Uh, and the way you, you've answered that, I don't know whether you want to add anything to what, what you recommend to us. No, uh, uh, sometimes when I'm asked that question, I say knowledge is power. And so it's important to be informed and to learn about these things. Um, so I guess I would throw that in too. The question is, why did uh, textile, rayon textile manufacturing in the United States, even if sponges and, and uh, cellophane and uh, skinless weenies continued? And um, I, I think it was part, partly connected with the general textile decline here, so it wasn't just rayon. I mean, there's not much polyester made here either, or even nylon. So I think it was. It was that, I don't think it was, the trend was already well underway um, before, you know, before environmental controls would have really uh, kicked in and made it. So I think it was the, that kind of economics. Uh, the question is, is litigation a, a, a solution? And the problem with litigation in the occupational context is, of course, the workers' compensation system. So you are barred legally from suing your employer in almost any scenario. It has to be unbelievably blatant. Uh, so unlike asbestos, where all of the suits have been not that you work for Johns Manville, but you work for somebody who bought something from Johns Manville, there's not a, a corollary in the carbon disulfide world. But if, if to talk about how things are not necessarily logical, um, there's a medication uh, that's used and is still licensed for uh, alcohol abuse, uh, and a an aversive therapy called antabuse. The chemical is called disulfiram. Uh, and it, the way it works is that if you are on that medicine and you go off the wagon and drink, you become violently ill because that particular uh, chemical uh, blocks uh, part of the metabolism of alcohol, so it stops at a very uh, nasty intermediate. Well, it also so happens that the, we ourselves, of course, metabolize this drug, and what we metabolize it to is carbon disulfide. So it's a nice delivery system for carbon disulfide, and you can actually track whether a patient on antabuse is being adherent to therapy by measuring how much carbon disulfide they exhale on their breath should you choose to do. So to me, it's inconceivable that a drug like that could be legal and on the market. And in fact, when a, a burnt out alcoholic on disulfiram starts losing nervous sensation, one of the toxicities of, of carbon disulfide is always attributed to the alcohol, not to the... Yeah, so what the question is, what are the hazards of making silk? The, some of the hazards of making silk are, are musculoskeletal. It's pretty demanding, you, you know, with the hands. And then there are some of the, you know, the caterpillar remnants are, are, are allergenic. So you can actually develop allergy or asthma, workplace asthma as a silk worker. But in the big scheme of things, uh, not much. Whereas there's a lot of other issues, let's say, in you know, cotton manufacturing, because growing cotton is very pesticide intensive, and then the early stages of cotton processing cause uh, a lung disease, which is a little bit like asthma and a little bit like chronic obstructive pulmonary <coughs> disease. It's, in America, we call it brown lung, but it's, it's actually called in medical circles bisonosis, a, a term that was actually coined by Marcel Proust's father, just, who was an occupational public health doctor. Great question. I, I think. Do we, what's the question? Uh, so, what has this book done for social justice? <laughs> <laughs> or, or, as my my 
brother once confronted my parents to come back to the family and said, what have you ever done for the cause? <laughs> and particularly, as only adolescents can be cruel. Um, I recently was in the UK and did an interview with a reporter for the local paper in North Wales, uh, where these big factories had been. They're all closed down. The towers have been taken down. And he, he wrote this article for the, the, I don't know, the North Wales Daily News or whatever it was, uh, about the book and about my work. And it's one of these online things where people can write in. And I started getting these emails from people saying, you know, my, you know, my father died at the age of 45 from a heart attack. He worked at Cortals, and you know, I got five or six of these things, and uh, and then I got a, uh, I've gotten a, a, a reporter from the BBC interested in it, and he's going to do a story, I think, on the radio about Cortals and about North Wales and this factory. And he came to meet me in London um, on, on this recent visit, and where I was staying was right across the street from one of the department stores, to Benham's or one of those. And he said, well, let's take a break. You interviewed me. Let's see if we can find something made of rayon. So we walk into the department store. It took us about 35 seconds to find something made of rayon. And so, Cortals is still going strong. No, Cortals is completely non-existent. This was yep. imported from India, rayon. Cortals is not, doesn't exist. In fact, my publisher was very concerned that I was naming names uh, of existing corporations and that there might be some legal liability and I had to like respond to their, I didn't change anything. I think I toned one, one really nasty line down, but uh, I, they didn't need to be worried because most of these places have morphed so many times that the, the, the factories that I, the corporate entities I was writing about are, are, not, are not the same entities. So I don't, that, I don't know if that really answers your question, but I mean, I... You did something for the cause. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, it, you know, it's all incremental. It's little stuff. It's, uh, you know, yeah, yeah. But I was, that's the one thing so far that has really pleased me, that, that little... Was that in your mind when you were writing? Uh, yes, I wanted, well, not that exactly, but what I wanted to do was uh, name names and and memorialize memories of, of these, these people that are both good and bad. That's a nice, word, nice phrase, that name names memorialize people. That's, that's what historians are involved, uh, doctors and historians. Yeah, <laughs> except now with HIPAA we can't name names anymore, but you know. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, and so. And the book is available. The book's out, out there. Read the book. It's, uh, it, uh, I apologize, it's $40, but there's no tax. That's, uh, and, uh, uh, and I'm happy to sign any copies if anybody wants. Thank you.